OK. Hi, I'm Hussein, and I'll be talking about pathfinding algorithms. So number one, what is a path? A path is any route between any two given points. So you have your start and your end point, and a path is just any route between those two points. So what does a pathfinding algorithm do? Number one, it finds a path, but it also has the unique property to find the shortest path, the shortest path between any point A and B, and that's also called the most optimum path. So data structures. Data structures are exceptionally important for this problem because um, picking the right data structure allows you to leverage all these algorithms that you wouldn't have with any other arbitrary data structure. So how should we represent the pathfinding problem in terms of data structures? What is commonly used in computer science for pathfinding algorithms is a graph. And what is a graph? So we have this as our graph definition, which is a graph is an ordered pair G VE comprising a set V of vertices or nodes or points together with a set E of edges or arcs or lines, which are two element subsets of V. Yeah, that was a bit of a mouthful. So essentially what it is, it's just a group of nodes or vertices and connections. So it's just a collection of nodes and their respective connections. So this is a simple graph. And as you can see, it has the nodes A through G. And it has all their respective connections. So A to B is a connection, A to D, so on and so on. So for this problem, we need to classify graphs according to different metrics. And the first metric we're going to classify things is a weighted graph versus an unweighted graph. So what that means is on the left, you can see is an unweighted graph. So all of the connections between nodes don't have weights associated with them, whereas on the right, they do. So from node 2 to node 4, on the left, you have no um, weight associated, but on the right, you do. That was the first. And the second is a directed versus an undirected graph. So what that means is that the connection, the direction of the connection matters. So if you see in the first figure one, A to B and B to A is the same exact thing. Whereas in the directed graph, A to B and B to A are not the same thing. And an example of that is E and D. So you see E goes straight to D, whereas D has to go to C, has to go to E. So using those two, now we have a central data structure for our pathfinding algorithms. And we'll go through a very simple example. So you see this. This is a 2D array of x's marking walls, and s is our start node, and o is our final node. So we're going to try and implement a pathfinding algorithm from s to o. So I said we should use graphs, but this problem has a 2D array. So what gives? A 2D array could actually be imagined as a special type of graph. So you can actually convert a 2D array into a graph. And this is a visualization. This is a 2D array, and if you zoom in, there's actually a graph. So each element within the 2D array has a connection to all its neighbors, so up, right, down, and left. So that's how to visualize a 2D array as an actual graph. So now you can apply all the algorithms within graph theory to 2D arrays. So I'll be going through three different algorithms. There's depth first, breadth first, and Dijkstra's. Um, not all of them are great for pathfinding, as you'll see, but it's um, really good for visualization purposes. So there's three key methods to the approach in all three of these algorithms. Firstly, it's choosing a current node. How do you choose a current node for a pathfinding algorithm? Then how do you update the neighbors of that one current node? And lastly, how do you set the parents of those uh, neighbors to the current node? There's a special technique. So going through breadth first search. Here's some pseudo code, and then we'll go through um, an example. So here, this isn't real code. So what happens in breadth first search is there's this thing called a frontier which can be a list or a queue. And that's all the nodes that have the potential to be explored. So I can start off, I just have, I've, initiali I've initialized the current node. And then I have a frontier, which is a queue, and an explored list, which is empty at the beginning. So I'm trying to loop while the, um, the frontier isn't empty. So I do, the first step was getting the current node. The same thing as a normal queue. You just get the first one. Remember, first in, first out. Then the second line shows that if you've reached the end um, node, you can break if you want. And then what you're doing is the second step. Now you're getting your neighbors. So I've said get the neighbor. So there might be a method called get neighbors for any given node. And then you push those neighbors to the frontier. And you remove yourself from the, front, uh, the, from the frontier. And you push yourself to the explore list. That's essentially what happens. And depth first search is almost the exact same thing, apart from instead of a queue, you're using a stack. So now I'll show you a visualization of a project that a friend and I built. So now I have this. And 
I have a start and I have an end node. And if I was to visualize breakfast, so you'll see if you're getting your neighbors each time and adding it to a queue, you get this diamond shape. And it's exploring all of the nodes that are next to it, then for those, and then it returns the shortest path. So you're returning the, uh, the neighbors for each one, and it gives you a diamond shape. So what happens if you choose the same exact thing with depth versus search? It gives you an absolutely horrible path, but it does it exactly like a, using a stack. And that's your shortest path, which actually isn't a shortest path. So uh, breadth versus search guarantees you to have a shortest path if you have an unweighted, no, uh, unweighted graph, whereas depth versus search doesn't. So moving on, now we have an algorithm called Dijkstra's. What is Dijkstra's? Dijkstra's is just an implementation of breadth versus search, which takes into account weights. So we had an unweighted graph, and now we have a weighted graph. So this is almost the same apart from our frontier now has all of the nodes within the graph, and the first thing you have to do is initialize them. So um, yeah, you're initializing every single node within the frontier to have a distance property of infinity. Everything has a distance property of infinity apart from the start node, which has a distance property of zero at the beginning. So what you do is the exact same thing. You're getting your, so the way you get your current node is slightly different to breadth versus search, where it's just getting the first thing within the queue. Now you're getting the first node according to a sort. You're sorting them based on that distance. Everything has infinity at the beginning, so you're apart from the start node, so your current node is start node. And what you do is you get your neighbors, and it also has a special thing called update neighbors. So for all the neighbors that you get, you update them as well. So th this is what update neighbor does. It gets any node that you're checking as a neighbor, and it gets the distance to that neighbor from your current node, and also the connection distance. Remember, it's just a node and a connection. It adds those two together. So it checks if this new distance is smaller than the distance that the uh, neighbor had with it associated. So it's infinity at the beginning. So every time you first check something, it'll always be smaller, and you'll update it. So this is the visualization of that. You start at A, and you, you get your neighbors, which are B and D. And then what happens is three, uh, 0 plus 3 is smaller than infinity. 0 plus 1 is smaller than infinity. You update um, 3 and 1. And those two are now pushed to the frontier. And now you mark A as um, explored. And the smallest node in the frontier is now D, which has 1. And you do the same exact process again. Now it has B and E as neighbors. And now you do 1 plus 1 is smaller than 3. You update, you update that. And you keep going up until this end one all the way at the bottom. And that's either when you have um, all nodes explored, or if you want to stop as soon as you've reached the final node, just break. So A to B, if you want it in that bottom uh, left, as soon as you reach B, you know that that's the smallest um, path from A to B. So now is an example of how Dijkstra's would look compared to um, breadth research. So as I said, breadth research is as a diamond. Now it's slightly unweighted, this graph, um, but they're essentially almost going to be the exact same thing. This graph associates weights with if you're turning right or left. So it's slightly different, but very similar. So you're essentially getting the same thing, but it's a bit different. The only difference now comes in if you're adding actual weights. So I'll just move that there. And if I clear, if I add a weight, so these yellow things are weights, as I said, breadth research doesn't take any weights into account. So what happens is, just choose an algorithm, breadth first search. It'll plow straight through them, and it doesn't really care about the weight. But if you had Dijkstra's, it'll try its best to avoid that weight, because the distance is very high compared to other nodes. So if I just put random weights here again, it'll try its best to avoid it. So can you see it's going round? It explores some of them, that one that was explored, but it avoids them. So that's how Dijkstra's works and optimization. So when you get really large frontiers, what usually happens is this highlighted part, if you can see it, it's current node equals frontier.get first, becomes really expensive. If you have a very large set of frontiers, you're trying to sort them based on distance each time. So what you can do is change your data structure. Instead of just a simple array and doing array methods like um, dot sort, what you can do is instead use a binary heap. So what is a binary heap? It's the same as a normal binary tree, except it has a property. If you have a max heap, that means that the node that you're currently at is at least as big as its children. So 77 is at least as big as 54, uh, 52 and 44. Or it's a minimum heap where it's at least as big as its children. 22 is smaller than 33 and 44. So 
um, the operation is just over one operation. If you want to get the minimum node, it's just get the first thing within the, um, the heap. And binary, tree, uh, binary trees can be represented as arrays, which, are, which is also nice. So any node um, to the left of uh, a parent is still its parent's index 2n plus 1. So 2n plus 1 of 0 is 1. 2n plus 2 is 2. And that's how you can represent it as an array. So uh, Dijkstra's has um, a few problems. Number one being negative weights. What happens if uh, a connection has a weight that is negative? So th this was the last thing. So if, if we were to do the same exact example, you have starting at S, you go down, what is the smallest one? It's V, which has a weight of 1. And now I want to go to W. W has a weight of 2 now. But the problem is it will never go down the path of S, U, W, because 2 is always going to be smaller than 3. So it will never take into account those negative edges because of the fact that 3 is larger than 2. So Dijkstra's doesn't really work with um, negative weights. So that was my presentation. And thank you very much. <laughs>